Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett and welcome to a new episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. I've got a pretty interesting episode for you today, I think. I call it Those Amazing USOs. And USOs are, of course, Unidentified Submersible Objects. I've been studying USOs for a very long time, ever since I started receiving reports in this one particular area. This is the Santa Catalina San Pedro Channel, right off the coast of Southern California. And up to today, I've documented more than 150 cases in this one area. So clearly something very profound is happening here. That's what I'd like to talk about today. I've got a bunch of cases, over a dozen, involving USOs, UFOs, and these are some really unusual cases. Uh, a huge wave of sightings in, over a period of days. Uh, some cases involving direct contact. Some really interesting cases involve radar confirmation. So these are some important cases for sure. I think they provide some real good insights into the nature of the UFO phenomena and what's going on in this particular area. So that's why I wanted to do this episode for you today. There are some really early cases, some very recent cases, and a huge variety, like I said. So let's just get started. The first case I'd like to talk about today occurred on January 28, 1953. And this is right off the coast of Malibu, the center of all this activity. And on that day, January 28, Rex Hardy Jr., he's a retired lieutenant commander in the U.S. Navy and a photographer for Life magazine and a test pilot for Northrop Aircraft. So a very good witness, a trained observer. And he was flying over Malibu with two other crewmen at about 2.20 p.m., when these three men sighted four separate unknown flying objects, which they described as being about the size of a B-36 aircraft, so fairly large. They were circular in shape and aluminum colored, they said, and Lieutenant Commander Hardy estimated the speed of these objects at, get this, about 1,200 miles per hour. So they're moving quite quickly. It was a really excellent sighting. And what's very interesting is it was just under seven hours later and about 50 miles farther south when another incident occurred over the cities of Newport Beach and Long Beach, which is, again, not that far away. This was at 9 p.m. when personnel in the control tower at El Toro Marine Base observed a UFO in the nearby vicinity at the same time that they were watching it from the tower at the El Toro Marine Base, employees at the Long Beach Airport Control Tower also observed what appears to be the same object. And in fact, Marine Jet Pilot Major Harvey Patton was quickly scrambled after the mysterious visitor, and he was able to pursue the UFO in his aircraft, which was described as a, quote, large fiery red disc-shaped object. And after about four minutes of pursuit, Major Patton, not surprisingly, was unable to close the distance between himself and the object, and the chase was ended. And that's not the end of this amazing series of sightings. At the same time as the above incident, Blue Book personnel Project Blue Book, of course, being the Air Force's UFO study project. Blue Book personnel were alerted to further UFO activity occurring over Point Magoo, which is located at the north end of the Santa Catalina Channel. And it doesn't appear that they actually had any information about the other activity going on, though they did declare this case unidentified. It was at 1.06 p.m., when Mr. R. W. Love, owner of the Love Diving Company, and another witness, Mr. Ferenti, were engaged in retrieving radio-controlled drones on a boat about 1,100 yards offshore, just south of Point Magoo Naval Air Missile Training Center. And they saw a small object. What they saw, they described as a white, flat disc 
with fuzzy or shimmering edges rapidly approaching from the northwest and flew straight and level and actually overtook a jet aircraft flying at about 150 to 200 knots and it was very quick three seconds passed overhead and disappeared in the haze to the east so an interesting case that was a lot of sightings in one area at one time and it was just six months later in August of 1953 there was another incredible sighting in this same exact area 1953 was a big year but in August of 1953 engineer Frederick Hare who would later become quite prominent in the UFO field writing about UFOs he witnessed a dramatic display of a UFO fleet over Santa Monica and as he says in his own words twice in one day I saw saucers and witnessed a whole squadron of them go through various maneuvers lasting 10 minutes. He says he observed, quote, brilliant white bars dart very quickly across the sky. Suddenly they all came together and formed a diamond pattern, he said, around a somewhat diffuse object. So these are moving in ways no aircraft that we have can move. And as he watched, this central object disappeared. The surrounding objects began to dart around, and they also disappeared. And it was later that evening, Frederick Hare returned outside and observed another UFO outside his home, which he described as looking, quote, like two Jupiters closely coupled, so glowing spherical objects. And he says they hung in the sky, motionless for just a few moments and then disappeared so yeah 1953 was a big year and there was a cluster of sightings in this one really sharply defined area and here's another cluster of cases which i find super interesting because this occurred over a period of about two days in one area and it's amazing radar confirmation it was March 22nd, 1957, at 11.55 p.m. Two objects were picked up on radar at Los Angeles International Airport. Uh, if you watched some of my previous YouTube episodes, you know I did a whole episode on UFOs over LAX. But this case is really interesting because these objects appeared on radar. And these targets appear to be rectangular in the size of a conventional target but the speed of these objects was approximately 3600 miles per hour they were first detected about 10 miles to the northwest and were heading at a 320 degree heading and then they stopped at approximately 40 miles of range and then zoomed back towards the station to approximately 10 miles of distance and then stopped again so these things are moving all over the place and stopping. The objects then proceeded on a 320 degree heading beyond the range of the radar. So authorities dispatched two F-89 jet fighters uh, from Oxnard just to pursue these UFOs. And at 12 minutes past the beginning of the sighting, at around 12.07 a.m., the radar station mysteriously lost its high voltage and went off. So I don't know if there's a connection there, but it is what it is. And what's important here is those objects were captured on radar. And this was just the beginning because the same day, this is at 12.10 p.m., right after this other sighting ended, it began up again. And this is at Point Magoo, which is pretty much the same area and a circular object described as having 16 equal sides about the size of a silver dollar in, a, in appearance uh, and whitish in color was actually observed by witnesses and did appear on film uh, the observer who saw this was actually watching missiles and there were other aircraft in the area now this film belongs to the navy and they refused to release it because it, they said it contains classified information. So this film was being 
taken in conjunction with missile testing. And the main witness was Raymond Wilson. And they were doing tests with the Regulus missile. Uh, there is documentation of this. And uh, the uh, SSM N8A Regulus was a ship. And it had a submarine-launched nuclear-armed turbojet-powered cruise missile deployed by the U.S. Navy from 1955 to 1964. So uh, it had a very interesting appearance. Uh, and when this missile was ready for launch, it was fitted with two large booster rockets at the aft end of the fuselage. So there is something clearly going on here, I think, with this UFO investigating what's going on with these missiles. At any rate, it was the next day when there was a bunch of sightings. In fact, on March 23rd, 1957, the very next day, thousands of witnesses over Long Beach sighted four large solid round objects flashing brilliant red lights. And some of these are really good witnesses, three Ventura County deputy sheriffs. And these objects were also tracked on radar. And it was at midnight that Air Force personnel actually made visual contact. And when they did, they sent out an F-86 fighter in pursuit, at which point the objects quickly climbed upwards and moved away. But the tower operator said that this object was, quote, moving much faster than anything I'd ever seen. About 40 miles away, it came to an abrupt stop and reversed course, all within about a period of three seconds. So again, something that our aircraft cannot do. And according to the radar returns, these objects were moving at a distance of 30 miles in about 30 seconds, or a speed of 3,600 miles per hour. Now the Air Force did quickly clamp down on the case and cover it up, and Major Donald Kehoe, a pioneering UFO researcher at that time, was unable to receive any further confirmation. But that was not the end of that sighting. Same exact day, 11.26 p.m., a round red-colored object with the apparent size of a grapefruit held at arm's length was sighted by ground observer personnel on duty. This object was at an estimated 4,000 to 5,000 feet altitude and was heading west until it disappeared. And the Ground Observer Corps personnel were not the only witnesses. Many other people saw the object and called the police and the Pasadena Filter Center. But among the Ground Observer Corps witnesses was Air Force Sergeant Dewey Crow. And he viewed this object through binoculars and they observed it for at least 14 minutes. So long enough to realize that this was absolutely unusual. And it was that same year, just a few months later, in the summer of 1957, that another Navy personnel uh, became a witness to UFO activity in this same area. Uh, I give him the pseudonym Austin Roberts. That's not his real name. He's anonymous, but he had joined the Navy three years earlier, and after completing boot camp, he became a radar specialist. And in 1957, the year of the sighting, he was assigned to training duty aboard the USS Columbus. And at the time of this incident, they had just departed from Long Beach and were off the coast of Catalina Island. Catalina is the center of all this activity. And as Austin says in his own words, it must have been about 7 or 8 p.m. just after dark when a hard contact blip showed up on my screen. It did not drift on the scope such as hard contacts do if you are passing or overtaking another ship. It just popped up on the screen. So he reported the contact bearing while other officers confirmed the blip on the other radar scopes. So this is clearly not a defect. This blip was about 20 miles from the USS Columbus which put it beyond the horizon line and out of sight, though still appearing on radar. And suddenly, 
a second blip appeared, followed by three more. They all came together in a V, for, v formation. So this sudden appearance without any visible approach on radar meant that these objects might very well be submarines. And as the witness says, certainly subs surfacing could account for this. However, there's a problem. As the witness explains, and I quote, five subs in V formation would be very unusual. So at this point, while he and the other witnesses were reading only the surface radar, which showed the distance of the object, but not their altitude, officers in the air radar stations also observed these objects on radar and actually reported that they were hovering in a fixed position at an altitude of 5,000 feet. And these objects remained in place for about 10 to 15 minutes and then began to disappear from the radar scopes one at a time and were gone. And as the witness says, needless to say, that event was the talk of the ship for a while. All the radars were checked and found to be operating normally. And talking to some of the old salts, I found out that they had similar experiences before on other ships. So I think the point of this case is, is that these sort of events happen regularly. And the ones we hear about are just the tip of the iceberg. We don't hear about most of them. There's something going on in this area, I'm telling you. Uh, year after year, decade after decade, there's activity going on here. And here's another case from a civilian witness, which occurred in 2004, as Richard, as I call him, that is a pseudonym, he was driving south on the Pacific Coast Highway towards Torrance. And right after turning inland, he saw, quote, three lights moving out towards the west in the open ocean. He says they were at a very low altitude, but were moving in a strange tumbling maneuver. And they were actually coming towards him, and soon they were only 400 feet above his car. And he could now get a good look at him and saw that they were two black teardrop-shaped craft. And each one had one extremely bright light on the very tip. And as he says in his own words, it did not make any sense that these vehicles would be right there on the PCH, the Pacific Coast Highway. They were now interweaving with each other, and boom, they took off almost instantly. This was so off the wall, I could not explain it. And he thought this would be a once-in-a-lifetime event, but it wasn't. It wasn't long after this that he got a repeat performance. Just a few months later, he had another UFO encounter, only this time he wasn't alone. He was with his entire family. And I will just quote him directly. As he says, We were coming home after a fishing trip to Catalina Island on the backside of the island. It was getting dark, so we decided to head home. We were on a 22-foot center console fishing boat. As we turned to the east side of the island and started heading towards Angel's Gate in L.A. Harbor, I looked to the west and noticed a circular craft in the air at approximately 5,000 feet to the north side of the island. So this is facing the mainland. And as he says, it had extremely bright lights around and on top of it. So he and his family were very much perplexed by the sight of this object. And as it began to move eastward along the front side of the island, he called out to his brother and to the captain, piloting the boat, saying, hey, look at that. And he says the captain looked up and said, that looks like a UFO. And uh, his brother looked at it and says, I kept watching the craft, and before I knew it, the craft shot straight up into the sky extremely fast and then disappeared. So they were absolutely convinced they had seen UFOs, and one of the witnesses later reported his sighting to New Fork, the National UFO Reporting Center. So many cases. Here's another that occurred one year later off the coast of Newport Beach. This is a very popular fishing site. And in fact, there's a lot of people who do, who do shark fishing off Newport Beach. 
And that's what the witnesses were doing here. This was on August 8, 2005, and a group of eight shark fishermen had a very close-up sighting of a UFO that was quite memorable. It was about 1.30 a.m., and they were 12 miles off the coast of Newport Beach, which is pretty much directly in the heart of the Santa Catalina Channel. And suddenly, one of the men called everyone's attention to a bright light hovering, get this, about 100 feet above the water. They estimate it was about four miles away. It was just a bright light. They couldn't see any kind of structure. It was southwest of them in an area of open water and was hovering in perfect silence. And as the witness says in his own words, then we noticed it started to get closer and bigger and some friends were getting a little freaked out but I felt only positive from it. It's strange for me to explain, but this is what I felt. I knew we had nothing to be worried about. So that doesn't surprise me. Sometimes people do get telepathic impressions or messages, but he felt this was a friendly object and that there was no reason to be afraid. And as he watched, as they all watched, this object suddenly stopped hovered for about 10 minutes, then reversed direction and moved off and faded away. And he reported this sighting to New Fork again. And according to Peter Davenport, the head of New Fork, Peter Davenport says, he sounded quite credible to us. A lot of sightings off of Newport Beach. Here's another that occurred one year later, approximately on December 2nd, 2006. This is a very interesting sighting with some unique elements. A large group of people had rented a beach house on Newport Beach as part of a pre-wedding celebration. And it was around 10 p.m. that evening when eight members of the party were hanging out on the beach and suddenly this eerie silence descended over the group followed by a dark shadow. And everyone stopped talking and what they were doing and looked at each other in confusion, trying to figure out what was going on. And as one of the witnesses says in his own words, and I quote, It's difficult to explain, but we all felt something was odd and stopped our conversations and tried to figure out what was different on the beach. We all saw a huge object hover low above us. It was just above the low-lying scattered clouds. It was like an enormously big shadow that hovered from east to west over the ocean. While it floated above us, you could hear the silence. It was too quiet. It was like the noise of life stopped. We all knew this was real as we saw the shadow of this object on the water. He estimates that it was about 500 feet wide and even though he had seen UFOs a few times before, this one really impressed him. I think it's an interesting sighting because of this eerie silence they're talking about. All life sounds stopping. This is what UFO researchers sometimes call the Oz factor. But it's interesting because this is often reported. And it's as if the wildlife around not only senses the object, but the silence becomes something that's really pronounced. So there's something going on with the environment here. It's an interesting case. And here's another in this same general area. This one is really unusual. This is a definite USO over uh, in the Laguna, Laguna Beach area. This occurred in June of 1963. The main witness uh, is anonymous. I'll call him Mark. He was the best man for a wedding being held along the coast in southern Laguna Beach. And he had just finished his current duties and decided to take a little nighttime walk along the beach. Now, in this area, there was a large wooden staircase that leads down the cliffs to the sand. So he climbed down and found himself hidden from the traffic of the pretty busy Pacific Coast Highway could still hear the cars kind of roaring faintly above him at the top of the cliffs. But looking out into the water, he saw something amazing. As he says, and I quote, I saw a series of lights glowing from behind the waves 
about five feet apart and eight inches in diameter. They gave the appearance of being portholes on the side of a submersible. So he was shocked by this sight and for a second wondered if it could be a military submarine, but it was far, far too close to shore. So he called it a, quote, unidentified submerged object. What was it? He doesn't know. As he says, I have no explanation. There is an interesting end note to this case. Later, he heard a lifeguard from the same area being interviewed, and the lifeguard was asked if he had ever seen anything strange in the surf. And Mark, the witness, was described to hear the lifeguard say the same thing. And he said he had no idea what it could be. So yeah, it's doubtful this was a submarine. They don't come right offshore like that. And it's one of many, many cases. And here's another case which occurred in 1972. This is off the Pacific Palisades area. This is sort of in the Topanga Beach, Malibu, Santa Monica area. And I like this case because it has something very interesting about it. The main witness, his name is Robert Snyder. And one evening in 1972, they don't know the exact date, he was staying in the home of his friend, Jim LeCron, and LeCron's family. And their home is located on the hills of Pacific Palisades on Anoka Drive. It has a large picture window which overlooks the Malibu and Santa Monica coastline. And it was that evening that Jim's mother noticed some unusually bright and colorful lights traveling down the Malibu coastline, heading towards them. And as Robert Snyder says in his own words, there was a telescope that sat by the large family room window and a pair of binoculars. All of us took turns trading off between the telescope and the binoculars. And what I saw was multicolored, white, blue, red, yellow, green, constant bright lights randomly flickering around the sides of a thick disc shape. So he estimates this object was about 200 feet high off the water line there and about 500 to 800 yards from the shore of Topanga Canyon Beach near a very well-known restaurant called the Chart House, as you can see pictured here. And, as Robert Snyder says in his own words, From our view, we were looking down on the UFO at an angle. It hovered there silently for a few minutes, then abruptly went into the water. And even with the naked eye, you could see the greenish illuminating glow from the craft being under the water. It stayed there under the water for a few minutes, not moving at all. And when I looked at it through the telescope, I could see the pattern of the waves going over the lighted seawater. So they knew this was very unusual at this point, and Lacron's mother became a little bit panicky and wanted to call the police or the Air Force. But meanwhile, Robert Snyder continued to view this object, and it appeared to be turning or elongating and increasing in size, he says. So he started uh, looking through this object, not with the telescope, which was being used by his friend, but with his naked eyes. And as he says, in a split second, it shot off at incredible speed from a standstill. It just streaked toward Catalina Island. Now, mind you, this is underwater, and it's moving at extremely high speed. And at the time, he tried to rationalize the setting as some type of secret military craft, but he's changed his mind after reviewing it. And as he says, it was not military. It came in slow, it hovered, it went underwater, and shot away very, very fast. Since then, I have flown helicopters and fixed-wing aircraft, and to this day, there isn't anything that could even remotely function like that. I know what we experienced was probably the most incredible thing I will ever see in my lifetime, and I remember it vividly. A really interesting case. Now I want to cover a few more cases off the point, off of, off of Point Magoo, where there's so much activity. 
and I like this case. This is so unusual. Uh, this case occurred in June of 1980 when two civilian witnesses were camping at Point Magoo. And I'll just quote the witness directly because he describes it quite vividly. As he says, We were walking along the beach and had stopped to watch what we thought were buoys bouncing on the tide. There were lights on top, which we did not find unusual as this is the case with many buoys. They are frequently placed at a distance close enough for swimmers and far out enough for boaters. And I was soothed by the motion of the lights. After a few minutes, I couldn't say exactly how many, the lights lifted and hovered. They stayed in that hovering position for about 30 or 40 seconds, then flew off. They took off to the left of us and were out of sight before I could even blink an eye. I had never, and have not to this day, seen anything that fast in my life. So yeah, they first thought they were buoys, then were shocked to see these things lift up, hover, and then dart very quickly away. So clearly not buoys. But just to confirm, the next day they did return to this spot to check, and they did find buoys easily and saw that none of them had lights on them and that what they had seen was completely different. As the witness says, I had my doubts about UFOs at the time, but they were quickly removed with that sighting. I have never had another sighting, but I would like to. Very interesting case. And here's another one in the same area, which actually caused some pretty big waves among the officials in the military who tried to cover this case up and debunk it unsuccessfully I think. This again occurred off of Point Magoo. It was on December 16, 1953, which again was a very busy year. The main witness, I love this, his name is Clarence Kelly Johnson and he's one of the designers of the U-2 aircraft. A very smart guy a great witness, very familiar with aircraft, and he was actually at Point Magoo looking through a window at a beautiful sunset when he recognized a dark elliptical form in the sky in the direction of the Point Magoo Cape. Now at first he thought this might have been a lenticular cloud or maybe a smoke trail from a plane, however it stayed fixed in the sky, unmoving for several minutes, so he called his wife over and asked her to bring him his eight power binoculars. Uh, what she did, he ran outside, and when he got outside, this object began to move, speeding up in the direction away from him in an ascending path contrary to the movement of the clouds on the horizon. So it's moving against the wind. And at this point, he could see that this object was pretty large. He estimates about 200 feet long and it was shifting around. Uh, he had no way to determine its precise dimensions, its distance or velocity, it being an unknown object in the sky. But simultaneously, a Lockheed WV-2 aircraft was being flown by one of his test crews over Long Beach, California. Now the WV-2 is a massive four-engine transport plane and it was loaded with equipment, radar antennas and such, constructed to fly long-standing patrols far off the coast of uh, the coastline there, basically to deliver long-range recognition of incoming Soviet aircraft. At any rate, important here is the crew spotted the object at about the same time he did, at about 15,000 feet altitude, and they were able to get a closer look and actually proceeded towards this object, which then took off at a great speed. So he reported this officially and said, and I quote, I am now more convinced than ever that such devices exist, and I have some highly technical converts in this belief. Now when the Air Force took a look into the this case, they concluded <laughs> remarkably that he and his wife and also the airplane team saw a quote lenticular cloud. This is a ridiculous debunking explanation. I mean this guy is an aircraft designer, he knows aircraft. This was not a lenticular cloud. 
despite what the Air Force says. It's really unfortunate that they continue to cover up this subject when it's so obviously real. Here's another case, mid-1980s, which comes from someone who's quite well known, Xander Smith. He worked in LA for 14 years as an art director and a prop master in the film industry. And he had a very interesting sighting. As he writes, one night, driving along the coast, heading north in Malibu on the PCH, Pacific Coast Highway, I saw what I thought were barges with what looked like 10K studio lights stretched out for about a third to a half mile, about 400 feet offshore on the other side of the beach houses. I figured it was a big money production filming a night beach scene. Being someone involved in film, that was his immediate go-to. But he soon found out he was wrong, because as he says, and I quote, the next day, there was a big deal about some mysterious lights out at sea off the coast, right where I was. The big deal was, there was no filming going on or any other event. And he learned that more than 100 people observed these lights either while driving along the coast highway or from their homes, which overlooked the area. And he also noticed that these lights were adjacent to the area where the continental shelf drops off to deep water. The Santa Catalina Channel is quite deep. It's got an average depth of about 2,500 to 3,000 feet, but parts of it are a mile deep, about 5,000 feet. And so much activity in this area. Here's a series of cases which were investigated by Southern California-based researcher Bill Hamilton. He's uncovered quite a few cases in this area. And starting in late 1989, he interviewed several people in the Marina del Rey area who were having repeated encounters with, quote, strange blue-green lights in the water. So this is really interesting because while there are many cases of fleets of UFOs, this is one of the fleet, few cases involving a fleet of USOs large numbers of objects underwater. And as Bill Hamilton writes, in 1989 and again in 1990, witnesses have seen as many as 20 events in an hour. One large light appeared to be as much as 100 feet in diameter, and this large light spawned babies no larger than 10 to 12 feet in length. These lights were seen to move swiftly under the ocean's surface some 500 to 1,000 feet from the coastline to Abalone Cove. One of the lights was reported to have emerged from the water. This is really interesting because you don't get a whole lot of cases of mother ships letting out little baby craft under the water. That's absolutely what's happening here. And this went on for years. It was in 1994 that he received another case involving two witnesses who were walking along the coast of Rancho Palos Verdes at Abalone Cove. This is in 1994, it's at night, and they saw what they described as several, quote, glowing disks floating in the water. And one of the witnesses returned shortly later, some days later, and saw the disks again. But on this occasion, he also saw several black helicopters in the area and he says that shortly later he was actually confronted by individuals who refused to name themselves but were clearly government agents of some kind and told him in no uncertain terms that this area was off limits. So it's clear that our government or elements within our government do know about the activity in this area. I just got a couple more cases I want to present to you today. Here's one from a gentleman by the name of Jason Brooks, who contacted me directly after hearing about my research in this area. And I'll just quote what he wrote to me. As he says, My name is Jason Brooks, and I find the research you have done to be very interesting, and I wanted to share with you a USO, UFO sighting I witnessed when I lived in Dana Point. Dana Point lies along the coast at the far southern end of the Santa Catalina Channel. And being a coastal resident, 
Jason has spent a lot of time on various Southern California beaches, and it was in 1996, while walking along with his girlfriend along Salt Beach in Dana Point, that he saw something very unusual. And as he says, and I quote, All three of us saw it. I saw it first. We were just sitting watching the waves, and I noticed a light on the water to the south towards Camp Pendleton. I didn't pay much attention to it as it was just sitting there. I figured it was a boat. That was until it shot straight up into the air and began doing maneuvers that are simply impossible by any known craft that I know of. It was doing impossibly tight loops and going from ocean level to maybe even thousands of feet in the air in seconds. So this object, this light, was moving in t tight, darting motions and kind of reminded him of a laser pointer. And as Jason says, it continued doing this for about 30 minutes and then faded away slowly until I couldn't see it anymore. Like I said, all three of us saw it. I went back out the next night to see if it had returned and it was there again, doing the same type of movements. And after having this series of sightings and unable to explain it, he decided to report what he saw. And I'm glad he did, because most people don't. And here's another super interesting case, because I think this one involves direct contact in a very unusual way. This is the last case I want to present to you. And this occurred over the Santa Catalina Channel in the Rolling Hills area. And I will just quote the witness directly. This is the daughter of a, a gentleman who worked for the Navy. And she, and apparently he, were having contact. And as the lady, the witness says, All my sightings occurred at night and predominantly over the Catalina Channel, which was the main view from our house. And she says that throughout the late 1960s, she saw numerous UFOs over the channel. And she says, almost all of the sighted objects appeared to pulsate primarily white light with beautiful laser-like oscillating red and green. These objects would consistently move with almost instantaneous speed, then at times maneuver in all directions. So despite having red and green lights, clearly not a plane. And in fact, the movement reminded the witness of darting bacteria or protozoa she says it was very erratic, yet very graceful at the same time. And she feels like there was definitely an intelligence behind their movement, because as she says, on numerous occasions, there were several UFOs in the linear formations, with some objects blinking out while others suddenly appeared. And from within these formations, much fainter and smaller objects, perhaps scouts, would come out of the formation and re-enter it sometime later. So these were mostly from a pretty good distance. However, she says on at least one occasion, occasion, she had a very close encounter. She was driving home and was about a mile away from her home in Rolling Hills when she saw a distant light over the channel and in a matter of seconds, the object was, quote, very rapidly overhead and was hovering right above her car. And this is where it gets even stranger. The witness says her body hair instantly began to stand on end, and at the same time, the entire electrical system in her car went haywire, with the radio, the horn, and the car lights all going on and off. And while this was all happening, she also heard a low whooshing sound coming from the object. So I think it's clearly doing this on purpose, and after hovering over her car, the object darted away, and get this, hovered directly over her house. And it remained there for a few minutes, and then resumed a position much higher up and further away. It moved erratically for a few seconds, and then, as she says, accelerated completely out of view at lightning speed on a diagonal tangent to the southeast. So she went home, she told about this experience to her parents, and her mother was very interested because she said she had heard this same weird whooshing sound on multiple occasions. But her father was skeptical. Now, as I mentioned, her father was in the Navy. 
He was a theoretical physicist responsible for designing ultra-low frequency antenna for U.S. Navy submarine contracts. At the time of this close-up sighting, uh, she slept in the den where her father worked on his theories. And one evening, shortly after this encounter, she woke up, this is so weird, to see her father come into the room in an apparent sleepwalk. And he began to, quote, write down equations on the large blackboard on which there were very intense high-order calculus equations related to his ongoing work. Now, the next morning, when her father woke up and saw the blackboard, he was not happy. He did not remember writing this. And as the witness says, later that morning, on his awakened discovery of the additions to the equation, he was very irritated and demanded an explanation. He was completely unaware of his contribution while in the trance-like state. Being a staunch non-believer in anything that would not pass his scientific criteria, he certainly would never entertain any suggestion of any outside interventive assistance as a viable explanation. So that's quite unusual, but it certainly wouldn't be the first time a UFO contactee has produced advanced equations or became very interested in mathematics and physics and quantum physics and all this stuff. So the witness herself does feel like these were positive encounters and that his, her dad was being contacted. Though he doesn't think so, she saw him do this. And as she says, these sightings continued to occur over several years until we eventually moved. I was always filled with a sense of friendship and beauty from these objects and never felt any fear or threats. I felt somehow almost a spiritual connection. I think that's a very interesting case, and I really wanted to include it because of this weird aspect to it. Those are the cases I wanted to present to you today, and I think you'll agree, yeah, there's a lot of different types of cases there, some really unusual ones, some ones that provide fantastic evidence of UFO reality, it always kind of makes me chuckle when people say there's no evidence for UFOs because there really is. It's not hard to find. These cases alone provide excellent evidence of the reality of UFOs. That was the primary reason why I wanted to do this video for you today. That and because this area, there's something really unusual about it. I did cover these cases in my book, Undersea UFO Base. So if you want to explore more about these cases and many others, I would recommend checking that book out. But yeah, I love this area. It's one of the major hot spots. I think mile for mile, the Santa Catalina San Pedro Channel produces more UFO reports than just about any other area on Earth. More USO reports, I should say. Uh, perhaps not the most, but it's definitely in the top 10 for sure. So that's the show today. I hope you've enjoyed it. I really appreciate you watching. And until next time, keep searching for the truth. Keep asking questions. And most important, keep having fun. <laughs> Bye now.